Sisters and brothers, we know that the environment in which you work is constantly changing, with new challenges emerging all the time. To deal with some of those changes and to help keep you safe on the job, the IFF continues to be intimately involved in the code development process. Most recently, building codes have changed to approve greater heights and areas of mass timber buildings to meet environmental and sustainability challenges. As part of our goal to promote firefighter safety, the IFF has been successful at passing additional requirements on these tall wood buildings. Whether you call them mass timber or tall wood buildings, we should all recognize that these changes directly affect your ability to fight fires in these structures. This program will highlight the aspects of this type of construction, the testing used, and the direction of the code process in addressing these buildings. We're confident this online training will better prepare you on the fire ground to help keep you and your crew safe. Thank you, and take care out there. Today, new codes and standards are being written and approved for the construction of tall timber or mass timber buildings. You probably know it as Type 4 or heavy timber construction. Currently in the U.S. and Canada, we limit Type 4 construction or heavy timber construction to six stories. Recently, there has been an international movement to permit these types of construction to go to greater heights. So today, what is mass timber in today's market? You hear the saying, we just don't grow trees the way we used to. Well, the movement in today's timber industry is to harvest these trees at a younger age. This means we're harvesting trees where they're smaller than they typically were 100 years ago. We have seen a number of cases where we have type 4, we relate it to heavy timber in a warehouse setting or a factory setting. Today's heavy timber is an engineered product. There can be a number of different types of engineered heavy timber. We can look at nail laminated timber. We can look at glue laminated timber. We can also look at structural composite lumber. But today what we're gonna focus on is cross laminated timber. This cross laminated timber is actually made of dimensional lumber, but it's set in perpendicular layers, glued and pressed together to form a panel. And these panels are typically very large and very heavy. They can be three, five, seven layers. This movement began a couple of years ago when a Canadian architect by the name of Michael Green proposed this structure of 33 stories. The structure is constructed out of combustible lumber. This proposal generated a great amount of interest across a number of disciplines. If you think about a mass timber building and you start to think about the construction or the appeal of this type of construction, and you think about the panels that we have, start to think in the form of the game of Jenga, where you take these wood panels and start to construct them together, making the walls and floors simply by lifting that panel into place, using an adhesive on the end, and then mechanically connecting them with long screws. That's basically how we're using CLT in the modern construction. As you can see on the screen, that shows how these panels are placed together. Now, this is where we see some of the disconnect within the industry itself. There have been movements recently in the U.S. and Canadian codes that have been propagated forward by the American Wood Council and Canadian Wood Council. These code change proposals were, were seeking to go to greater heights or permit higher timber buildings up to nine stories. The disconnect within the industry actually starts to get into the design phase because designers, architects, and the buying public want to see the aesthetic aspects of constructing a building out of wood. In this proposed design, all the structural interior wood is exposed. That is where the concern from the fire service comes because what is the contribution of this exposed wood to the fuel load that is already in today's modern fuel package? Also, exposing this wood is exposing the, the structural members to the effects of a fire and how does that perform, or I should say, how does that affect the performance of that structural member. This has led to a couple of efforts in the codes and standards arena to really study these two topics to try to provide some answers to the designers, to industry, and to the fire service. The first effort was initiated by the National Fire Protection Association, or NFPA. They commissioned the National Research Council of Canada to study the contribution of CLT to the fuel load. Trying to answer the question, 
would the CLT contribute to the fuel load and overcome the ability of that engine company to advance down that hallway to complete extinguishment. The National Research Council of Canada set up a series of tests looking at a typical one-room apartment layout using a typical fuel package that you'll find in today's residential apartment. Again, the tests were looking to quantify what this contribution of the exposed CLT would be to the fuel load. The baseline test of three layers of Type-X gypsum board on the surface of the CLT produced no contribution to the fuel load. In fact, it became a contents fire. So no CLT was damaged and no CLT contributed to the fuel load. But further test, in fact test two that had two layers of type gypsum board, gave us our first lesson in this type of construction. The fire was able to penetrate through those two layers of gypsum board into the top of wall joint of the CLT. In researching this and looking at it forensically, we found that the CLT panels were put together incorrectly, allowing that fire to get into that gap. This was an important lesson moving forward. In test four, we exposed the full ceiling to the fire in the compartment below. This was a second important lesson. What we started to experience when that CLT was under fire condition was premature delamination, meaning that the layers of wood within the CLT started to fail and drop away from the CLT panel prior to being fully consumed by the fire. Two concerns here were, what is the contribution to the fuel load by that premature delamination? Second consideration was, how does that impact structural performance? So this was an important lesson. And as you can see in this picture here, in the picture of that ceiling panel, you can see where the layers of the CLT started to delaminate. This led to a secondary flashover within that compartment. Eventually in test six, what we found is this accelerated delamination led to the collapse of the CLT panel as they were starting to initiate suppression. So this gave us a number of issues taking forward or a number of lessons learned as we start to address, should we permit greater heights in this type of construction within the codes process? The second effort was initiated by the International Code Council or the ICC. The ICC commissioned an ad hoc group to look at tall timber buildings. This ad hoc committee established a number of subcommittees. One of those subcommittees was the firework group that firework group worked with the American Wood Council and with the U.S. Department of Forestry to fund five separate tests, looking at the structural performance of CLT and also the conditions for the occupants and responding firefighters. We developed these five tests with the goal of replicating a typical apartment where we would see CLT construction. We were able to add in a hallway so we could start to measure the conditions in the hallway for that responding fire company. One of the biggest concerns that we had through the research were the connections. As with any type of construction, connections are the weak point. So we really wanted to focus on the performance of these connections. As you can see, each one of these tests were permitted to go to complete burnout, meaning that we did not initiate suppression prior to structural collapse or the end of the burning of the contents. Uh, in these series of pictures here, you can see where we are at ignition you could see where the living room and kitchen flashed over, finally the bedroom flashed over into the decay phase and the, the final act of where the fire experienced complete burnout. As you start to look at the walls and the ceiling, you notice that the gypsum board that's being required in the codes actually did its job. It protected that structural CLT. In these series of pictures, we have where we exposed 30% of the ceiling. We wanted to see if that ceiling area contributed to the fuel package or if it contributed to structural uh, degradation. Interestingly enough, in these tests, we did not experience any premature delamination. So we saw a, a different performance in the CLT itself from the earlier tests conducted by the NFPA and NRC. This video is from a test conducted at the U.S. Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms and Explosives, or ATF lab in Maryland. The ICC ad hoc committee commissioned the ATF and their laboratory to allow heavy instrumentation of the temperature throughout the structure, including the hallway. It also shows the heat flux experienced by surrounding structures and exposures to this building. 
as you see, we start from the initial ignition. And if you look on that exposed wall, that flame spread kind of quickly across the exposed wall, but that doesn't necessarily it means or leads to structural degradation. As that fire reaches flash over in the living room, you start to see it propagate over to the bedroom and we see very similar fire conditions or fire behavior in that bedroom. As you can see here, we're experiencing a significant fire event. In fact, we're generating over 20 megajoules of energy within that compartment. We believe this is very typical of a residential structure or a residential fire that we would experience in the real world. Uh, that's why it was important for us to measure what the fire service would be exposed to. In the NRC test, we saw the early delamination of the ceiling contribute to the secondary flashover within that compartment, but it also contributed to the degradation of the structural performance. In the test at the ATF lab, we did not see that early delamination. In fact, we barely got through the first surface of the CLT. This started to give us, again, some more concern about moving forward and some points of interest that we needed to address within the codes and the standards to ensure the consistency of the CLT product once it got into the marketplace. This is the Brock Common Tower in British Columbia. It is a student living center. It is 18 stories and it is a mass timber building. Typically, any mass timber building over 12 stories is going to be a hybrid type of construction, meaning that it will have an interior concrete core for egress requirements. Starting with that concrete core, it uses a combination of structural steel and CLT panels to construct the floors, ceilings, and walls. This is a building that has been approved in Portland, Oregon, even though the U.S. codes only permit heavy timbers construction to go to six stories. Local jurisdictions throughout the administrative portion of the code are permitted to go to greater heights. Throughout these testing processes, we learned a number of lessons. We highlighted some of the lessons that we learned within the NFPA process. We also highlighted some of the lessons we learned in the ICC process. This has led to the ad hoc committee to submit code change proposals to address these concerns. A couple of the code change proposals really start to address the absolute need for the consistency of the product, meaning the CLT, and the consistency of the construction. The new code change proposals will require special inspections during the construction of the CLT structure, meaning we're gonna have specially trained inspectors coming in to make sure that these mechanical connections are being done correctly. We're also looking at building these mass timber structures to greater heights. We want to ensure that both the passive and active requirements are in place. In buildings 120 feet higher of mass timber, we're actually going to require redundancy of the water supply system, very similar to what we were able to get in the codes after 9-11 in buildings 420 feet and higher. We wanted to ensure that that active protection will be in place when needed. We also want to ensure that the passive protection is going to be in place when needed. So the ad hoc committee proposed a code change moving forward that would require that building owner to commission someone, whether it be his staff or a third party inspector, to come in and ensure that all of the gypsum board that is required to be within that structure is maintained properly. If we're going to allow greater heights based on the passive and active protection, we have to ensure that they remain in place the ad hoc committee has proposed a code change that would actually require that the passive protection be in place four floors below the active floor. Meaning that once you start building that additional floor, you have to have passive protection in place four floors below it. So as an example, if you initiate construction on the seventh floor, floors one and two have to have protection in place. There's a great deal of interest in cladding fires right now and we had a number of concerns brought forth that started to ask questions on the cladding and now a combustible structure to greater heights. The code changes that were placed forward by the ad hoc committee will not permit combustible materials to be in the exterior cladding. One of the most important lessons that we learned through these two years of research was that we needed to ensure the consistency and the quality of the CLT product. The best way to accomplish conformity is to require that the adhesives perform adequately under fire conditions. 
This required approval by the Adhesive Standard Committee and changes to the adhesive standard to ensure that it would perform under fire conditions. This adhesive standard is PRG320. The Technical Committee of PRG320 actually adopted an appendix that will require full-scale testing of all CLT panels, including the proposed adhesive. To ensure that the quality of the CLT product remains consistent over time, we use the scale of test 4 in the NRC test with the exposed ceiling to start to expose it under similar conditions and then to start to measure the delamination. As we wrap up this very brief look at tall timber buildings here in the U.S. and Canada, it's important to be reminded of a couple of things. When looking at tall timber buildings, it's important to remember our work environment is designed, built and maintained utilizing the minimum codes, whether it's to the U.S. and the ICC codes or the Canadian codes. They establish how our work environment as firefighters is designed, built and maintained. If we want to have a voice in our work environment and how that environment is designed, built and maintained, we have to be involved in the process. Also, remember that mass timber construction is not dimensional lumber. It is not stick frame or light frame construction that we see in a typical multifamily home or multifamily apartments today. Mass timber construction behaves very differently under fire conditions due to the mass of the product. And even though the examples given here are 12 to 18 stories, the human imagination doesn't end here and projects have been proposed to greater heights, such as the River Beach Tower being proposed in Chicago, Illinois of over 80 stories. The fire service everywhere must be involved in the testing and establishment of codes and standards to ensure the promise of ideas from CAD to construction results in the safety for both occupants and firefighters. Hope this informs you a little bit about what's going on in mass timber in a very short time period there's much more to go. Please be careful and stay safe. Mm -hmm.